Hello, welcome to Shalom World. My name is Patricia Keane and I'm coming to you from Maynooth in County Kildare. I'm here to present a 12 part series on pornography called The Porn Disaster. It's not that pornography shows too much, it's that it shows too little. It makes no biological or psychological sense. Once you've hit that peak, you completely plummet because there's no one there. The whole experience is not reality. As humans, we're striving for connection. We've been looking at porn from all different aspects and in this episode we're continuing to look at porn from the adult point of view and that is we're going to debunk some myths around pornography and my guests here today Father Alan Hoffa, priest from the Diocese of Allentown, USA. He has BA in Philosophy and Masters in Divinity. Father Chris Hayden, priest from the Diocese of Ferns, Ireland. Spiritual Director, St. Patrick's Seminary, Maynooth. Professor Patricia Casey, Professor of Psychiatry at University College, Dublin, Ireland. She is a psychiatrist, journalist, commentator on social issues. Dr. Kilty Oberlin. She's from Ireland, doctorate in psychology and master's in counseling, specializing in eating disorder recovery. So we're going back to look at some more issues around adults and porn and particularly the myths that are surrounding pornography. So the first one I want to look at is is rather big. Um, it's how porn treats those it portrays above all women as objects rather than persons. What does this mean and what is the harm? So I'll go to you first, Father Chris, on this one. OK, thank you, Patricia. Yes, that's uh, it's been said that the most precise opposite of to love someone is not to hate them, it's to use them. Mm. It's to treat what is personal, a person as subpersonal, purely as an instrument, a tool, an object. That's really the opposite of love, because if we hate someone, not that we want to be going around hating, but at least I have an emotional connection. I am just completely cold with regard to a person I want to use, and that's treating a a human person as a tool, a subhuman, in a subhuman, impersonal way. One of the myths, and I guess it's it's myth in inverted commas, but a myth around pornography, and this might speak, speak especially to young people, perhaps to adolescents, because it shifts away from a kind of a moral comment to a, a broader, uh, more human, a, a very human take on it. It's not that pornography shows too much, it's that it shows too little. When someone is looking at, if a man is lusting over uh, a graphic image of a woman and an over pornographic images of women. He's not seeing too much. He's seeing too little. What is he not seeing? He's not seeing a daughter. He's not seeing a mother. He's not seeing a broken heart. He's not seeing someone who's been exploited, someone who's going to terrible lengths to try to make ends meet, someone who's trying to deal with her own past traumas. He's not seeing any of that. So he's seeing far too little. And that's what pornography does. It takes a whole human person and it reduces them to their body parts. And that's using, it's objectifying, and it's very wrong. And I think in emphasizing that particular myth, that it shows too little rather than showing too much, we kind of shift the focus away from, oh, well, this is wrong, you mustn't do it, to what do you care about? Do you care about people? And that's a different kind of a question. It's also a moral question, but it's a warmer kind of a way of approaching things. Okay, and that is not something that anybody considers when they're watching pornography. Does that apply to women who watch pornography? I assume it does. We don't know very much about women and pornography because by a ratio of two to one, pornography use is much more common in men than in women. But I would assume that they engage in it for the same reasons as men do, because they want to get kicks. They, they want the um, surges of pleasure that go with sexual activity, only doing it using um, distant, um, in a, almost inanimate people. To come back, though, to the to a related issue that Father Chris mentioned, when people engage in pornographic activity, there's there's a bit of a ritual about it in that people have to switch on their their monitor, they have to sit down, they have to go into the site, and then they look at the screen. 
and they have an orgasm or ejaculate or whatever while they are watching it. But what they're seeing on the screen is is usually a personification of of a woman that I mean, at, at one level, they are human beings because th- th- there were women who were photographed for this and who participated. But when you when the when the individual is looking at them, they're not seeing a human being. It's just an object who is completely different from any other woman they will probably ever meet in their lives. Most women do not look like the women who um, feature in pornography. So what people are falling are falling for and become a attracted to and what generates the flow of dopamine and oxytocin is this unrealistic image on a screen. They're not touching, they're not feeling the person, they're just sitting there watching them with their hands on the table or whatever. And that's a very odd way of relating to human beings. Most of us we, we, we reach out to people, we shake their hands, we hug them. Even professionally, you would shake hands with, with, with somebody. So what, what's the whole interaction is, is a remote, cold interaction. And getting, getting a surge of dopamine or any other neurochemical from such an encounter is quite abnormal. And so for anybody to say that, um, a bit of pornography is okay and it'll enrich your marriage. It makes no biological or psychological sense when you think of it in terms of this distant, inanimate person that the watcher is getting their, their thrill from. Thank you for explaining that. It, it comes together when you start bringing in the neuroscience. Um, Father Alan, I know you want to get in on this, but I'd want to come to Kilty. Um, first, because you're working with young girls. OK, and the question that I they're coming to you because of eating disorders, but you examine every aspect of their life to see what is going on. And you said in a previous segment that they're not connecting that the the pornography, the looking at pornography to an eat to the eating disorder. Now, so what are the what are the young girls telling you about how they feel about their own body. What's it doing to their own image? When they're coming, when, when people come in, they're, they're coming in for specifically, I want help with the eating disorder. But as we delve into their relationships with self and with other people, we start to see that there's this longing for connection with other people to feel safe, secure, good enough. and. I've heard, it, I'll, I'll say, an, uh, give an example of, I've heard this a number of times where, let's say somebody is, a, is beginning to date and beginning to consider sexuality and the relationship, and, and they know that the boys are watching porn, they begin watching porn. So their purpose for engaging is to, you know, see what, you know, what is attractive to them and are shocked, upset, and horrify. So it's not, they weren't, it's not necessarily, they weren't engaging for pleasure, but they were trying to find out what are these guys attracted to. And then immediately they begin to say, I can't compete with that. I don't know if I want to compete with that. So it sets up these expectations of not. Now, the other thing is, is that when and if, like uh, Patricia, I love the way you put that, so aptly when somebody is stimulated and they 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 feel they they experience sexual pleasure when watching then it almost is as if they need to be it sort of sets this standard of this is what i need to be attracted to so for the girl and for the boy you know i know i just switched here but for the girl and the boy it's setting standards for what they should be attracted to however in the real world they're we're not fine like patricia's saying we're not finding that so instead of so basically it's setting up that this whole idea of of objectification it's setting up the idea that sex is to be done it's an activity and 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 both the men and the women are objects in that. So it's reinforcing that setting up a conflict. And there's not, I think the idea of when people, because I also hear this, that a myth that pornography can be educational. 
is one that needs to be knocked out of the water because, as Patricia said, as, as we're all saying, it's not reality. The whole experience is not reality. And I kind of think it, it just reinforces objectification. And what we really need, as humans, we're striving for connection. And so, and that is absolutely not possible with a screen. Listening to Keelty there, I'm mindful of a comment from uh, uh, the American feminist Naomi Wolf. And this is apropos of the whole idea of, you know, who can compete with these perfected images on the screen. Mm -hmm. And Naomi Wolf says very tellingly, compared to uh, the pornographic images, uh, real women are just bad porn. That's the way a lot of male brains get mm -hmm. rewired to have these impossible expectations. Real women are just, just bad, bad porn. porn. Mm -hmm. uh, so th th that's mm -hmm. obviously ruinous for relationships and for, for, you know, just normal male, female. That's quite a sad comment. Sure, uh, that's a downgrader straight away. Yeah. Father Alan, you're bursting to get in there. I, I really am because <laughs> all three have given me so many things that connect with this wonderful ministry that I've been called to in working with people at all ages and male and female. And, you know, when I speak to young people and especially when I teach, one of the things that I want them to always take away if I say, if there's anything you're going to take away from this whole year of education, it is the exact fact to which you spoke to that the opposite of love is use. We as a society have dumbed down love so much that we allow all of these usury methodologies in our human experience to be cloaked over as love. And what that does is it leads to the ability for objectification. Because once I allow myself to be used, I'm giving myself willingly into the objectification. No woman, for instance, would say, oh, I'm willingly giving myself to objectification. I want that for myself or for women in general. And yet it's important to see that it does happen easily. And with that, we've seen that the rise in uh, eating disorders, um, especially has come with the proliferation of so much pornography, because it's the way in which I feel about myself. But the warp that happens in there, as you said, Kilty, is a, a woman goes and she it, it feels that, that she can't compare, but also what happens is in not comparing, I do need something, I do need something relational, and the porn becomes that thing that becomes my relation to that I need, and the man has that relation. And I think that that also connects with, Professor Casey said, in the fact that when we look at women, the difference is, is their emotional intelligence is different from men. And so what we see on the, porn, on the pornography level is that women, when they look at porn, a lot of men, they'll look at an, a still frame or they will look at the actual act of a, a sexual act. Women are much more inclined to a video that tells a story. They're more inclined to pornography that is written for instance, you know, we think back to the rage that Fifty Shades of Grey was. That was the start of the, a real big porn push. And people think that wasn't porn. Oh, yes, it was. It was written porn. And then, of course, it became a movie because it hits that emotional core that we, that women especially, are more inclined towards than men that fulfills that. And I wanted to, this was also our teaser from the last episode with Professor Casey, is as we're talking about those neurochemicals, one of the things in the what when we do this work is we talk about the acronym PMO, pornography, masturbation, orgasm. And one of the things that happens is a lot of people, they'll recount that after they've done PMO, that they feel awful. And that's what we call a chemical dump that happens, especially with that oxytocin. And this is something that on a general level of human sexuality is often lost, especially with the sexual act. What is meant to happen after man and woman, husband and wife come together in the unitive uh, sexual act is that there's supposed to be connectedness after that, that once you hit that pinnacle, then it slowly comes down. But what happens with the PMO is once you've hit that peak, you completely plummet because there's no one there. The, you're, you're not, the, the screen's not going to comfort you. The, there's no one there to comfort you. And that has such a negative effect, again, chemically on the brain that can be so very, very destructive. So this whole thing that no one's being harmed in this, no, the objectification of women, the harm to the person on a chemical level, on an emotional level, on a physiological level, it's all happening. And these are so many of these different facets of pornography. And of course, f flowing from that, just to, to come back to the reality 
of lovemaking. After a couple of husband and wife have made love, they usually go to sleep in each other's arms. Mm -hmm, exactly. And there isn't any arm to hold. Bingo. There's nobody for you to envelop yes. afterwards and say, I love you too, or that was great or whatever. Um, it's just an empty screen. Exactly. And hence the, you know, the, 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 emptiness. the emptiness. I want to come back to the boy and the girl again, the expectations that um, that boys have of girls, okay, um, in in a relationship. And Father Ed, I'm coming back to you on this one because you have the experience um, because you've been in high schools, okay, and then you're dealing with 17 and 18 year olds and younger. But um, I I have I've, in researching for this, I've come across information about what boys want to do with girls um, during sex. And it's frightening to to read it, the expectations, you know, that they've been watching pornography and they want to take it into a relationship with a, a woman. And it involves strangling, mm -hmm. choking, masturbating all over their body, whipping. It, it's really so incredibly nasty. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been in the schools, you've been hearing this, so just take us through that. Well, the big thing is, Patricia, is that this isn't limited to the schools and to, uh, yes. and to young people. Yes. This is happening in marriages. Mm -hmm. This rea this reality of what's being seen is being transposed from the screen into every age. Uh, I think I may have me mentioned in a previous uh, episode, but one of the things that's on the rise because of, por uh, of pornography is rape in marriage marriages because there are women who do not want to uh, enter into these recreations of what their husbands are seeing on these screens and but they're they're forced to and again defined doesn't matter if you're married or not defined forcible sexual encounter is is rape um, is sexual assault and so we see that yes the, now the difference is is that because of the maturation process Adults, while they can still sink into depression because of these things and can recede from society and relationships, for a younger person, it is even more damaging because they feel that they don't have a voice. They haven't grown into, had those life experiences that gives them the willingness to fight back, bounce back. And so it can be it can be especially dangerous for them. But across the board, we're getting into this whole thing. And as Professor Casey said, and, and we've all brought up in different ways, is the deepening of this as it goes deeper and deeper, that need to get that next fix. And I use that word next fix because we know so much about drugs, the corollaries of how this works. And yes, we don't know as much because the longitudinal studies haven't been done in regard to pornography, but we see so many crossovers, especially with things like drugs, that we can say that the deepening of that next fit, it gets worse and worse and worse. The problem is, is that we know that death can occur uh, because of drugs. And it's not so much the death that happens to the, the physical body with pornography, but the death that happens to the soul, the death that happens to the esteem, the death that, the death that happens to the will, the death that happens to the heart. And that can be so destructive, especially for a young person, because they have the rest of their life, they're going to look for their spouse. What does that tell them about who their future spouse should be? Someone that should abuse me, assault me, and that is okay, because pornography is okay, it's widely accepted, so this must be normal. And what's also done is that they're pushed into silence where they don't talk about it because there's a part of them that says this is embarrassing, this is hurt, this is hurting me, and yet at the same time they have this voice of the person who's supposed to love them who's saying this is okay, this is what we should do, and it becomes very confusing. Just following up on, mm -hmm. on Father, it's the, the young people, the, the scary thing is, is that it's so pervasive. We know that we're seeing the numbers and whenever we see numbers, we can assume because there's shame attached to it that, that the number's actually even greater. I'm hearing the stories. Um, and the scary thing is, is that we're coming into a generation of kids that are believing that this is sex. Mm -hmm. Uh, and adults, you know, and it's I'm, normal. Uh, th it's that sex is uh, that that pornography mm -hmm. sex like mm -hmm. what's happening in the screen bdsm um all of the you know where you hear derogatorily vanilla sex mm -hmm. so with vanilla sex what's which that? is 
mm-hmm. which is which is human lovemaking. <laughs> Dum- normal heterosexual <laughs> penal <laughs> you know, vag- vaginal sex. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That w- so it's co- but it's it's talked about as a derogatory as if this Boring. other stuff yeah. And so people are considering mm-hmm. it as excitement. And when you think about it it's coming in it made me th- think when you talked about sh- 50 shades of gray mm-hmm. that it came into the I don't know the the average middle-aged um, and older um, populations and began to be talked about. Well, that peaks an in interest and people go looking. And so the whole idea, the value of sex is, is, is getting diminished, mm-hmm. do you know? And so what that is, is it's reinforcing for this whole next generation that this is what they think. And so that reinforces everything that we're saying about ad- objectification. Um, yeah, and that's the scary bit. Uh, go ahead. Now I think we need a bit of hope. <laughs> oh, here well, most we do, and and we're we're here because we believe that there's a there's a battle to be fought, and we're fighting, but be, because we believe it's winnable. So there's hope, of course. Um, what what's needed behind and above and beyond all of this is a framework of view. What is the under? We can't people societally and individually. Nobody can get out of the morass unless they're holding on to something. And it's not about like providing an emergency life raft and then we go back to shore and it's a limited analogy. But uh, but the reality is, unless we have a framework of understanding for our human nature as sexual human beings, unless we have a clear understanding, then we're, we're only ever doing damage minimalization. We're saying this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. We can complain ad infinitum about what's wrong, but what is right is a sound, solid understanding of human sexuality as a vehicle for self-gift, for self-giving love. Mm-hmm. We talk about love making. I mean, that's that tells its own story, that that expression. But uh, culturally, all of this is associated with uh, with a, a particular faith angle. Uh, if you t- if you try to talk about the sense behind sex and so forth, you can be immediately painted into a corner. So the very thing that's needed is the most difficult thing of all to proclaim. And yet proclaim we must, because it strikes me, it has struck me repeatedly during these conversations over the last several episodes, the seamless fit. It's hand in glove between the Catholic moral position, the Catholic and underlying that the Catholic anthropology, the understanding of the human of the human person, the seamless fit between that and the issues we are discussing, even at the psychological, neurobiological level, the stuff that's going on. It's not a separate planet. We are we're, we're whole cloth in the end of the day, our human nature and our the truths of our faith, which are not little niche doctrinal truths, but fundamental human truths. They speak to these things. So we have a lot to offer and we must try to continue offering it articulately, compassionately, gently, but perseveringly. Well, we're out of time on this one. We knew it was going to just fly through because mm-hmm. we had so much discussed. But uh, what we try and do is anything that we haven't covered, we bring it into the next episode. Uh, so I want to look at in the next episode is have we become a pornographic people? How has that happened? And is the pursuit of sexual gratification a good thing? And what are the principles undergirding pornography? OK, so please join us for our next episode. Father, your prayer, please. A lovely prayer by Father Willie Doyle, a saintly Irish Jesuit who died a heroic death in the trenches of World War One. And it captures the sheer brokenness that people can experience, along with the invitation to trust, to turn to God with great trust. Oh, Master, I come to your feet to tell you all. I have lost what can never be restored to me in this world. I have come from the grave with half myself buried there. Where shall I turn for courage and for strength? Where but to you? Thank you very much for your very valuable contributions. And we look forward to you joining us on Shalom World for our next episode.